This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. I'm really pleased to be able to introduce our authors of the most recent featured article in the inaugural Sammy Viskin era of Heart Rhythm Journal. And we've got Zach Loring and John Pacini from Duke University talking about their natural history study of echocardiographic changes in atrial fibrillation. Welcome, Zach and John. Thank you. It's great to be here, Rod. Well, this was impressive because AFib and heart failure is such a hot topic. We've got the guidelines changing with understanding the really important pathophysiologic relationship between AFib and heart failure. And I think this might add to our understanding of how this promotes a deterioration in structural abnormalities, particularly FPEF, FREF, left atrial dilatation. Zach, tell us a little bit about how you personally got interested in this question before we dive into the methodology. Sure. Um, I think my interest in this is really uh, centered in the heterogeneity in atrial fibrillation. And my curiosity as to how the, um, the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation impacts the structure of the heart as well as clinical outcomes. And as a practicing electrophysiologist and seeing patients with different stages of, of heart failure and uh, different durations of AFib duration, um, I was curious to have a better understanding of how a exposure to atrial fibrillation may influence the cardiac structure as well as the development of different clinical outcomes. So basically, John puts you up to the task to screen like 13 years of echo data at Duke. Tell us a little bit about the methodology. Yeah. So we're very fortunate at Duke to have a large database of echoes that spans um, decades and uh, contains high density information about um, uh, volumes, structural uh, information, wall thickness, chamber size, uh, and both systolic and diastolic function, and uh, it really provided a great opportunity to explore questions of natural history um, in a large data set. So we started with a, about a quarter of a million echoes in our database um, that were in our target time period, and then we applied some exclusion and inclusion criteria to try to look at patients who had a new uh, new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation um, and compare them to folks who didn't have AFib. And it's uh, not trivial to identify that control cohort. We had to make sure that they had enough exposure in our system that we could be confident that they didn't also have AFib and was just under under um, coded in our system. But we made, made sure people had adequate follow-up or adequate um, expo uh, encounter history within our health record to be confident about their AFib status. And then we followed... Uh, the patients for up to five, you know, five to um, seven years moving forward, looking at their echocardiograms in, in series to see what changes uh, occurred among those uh, patients over time. And I think that's what's impressive, right, is to be able to look at this in series and look longitudinal across a given patient. John, any other thoughts on that methodology of what constitutes someone having AFib and what the minimum criteria were to be able to have multiple snapshots in time? Yeah, I, I just I, I think the most important thing I would add is we need to think about the people who are not in the cohort. So, you know, anyone who had an abnormal echocardiogram right off the bat because maybe they had unrecognized cardiovascular disease, those are not persons in our cohort. So we're really focused on the natural history and structural progression of cardiac disease in persons who have a normal heart when they're diagnosed with AFib. Excellent. So Dr. Loring, what did you find? So after we uh, identified patients with and without atrial fibrillation, we did a, uh, a matching process where we tried to match patients on age, uh, sex, a year of echo, and Chad's VASC score so that we had similar groups of patients with AFib and without. And then we followed uh, their echo uh, findings over several years. And we looked at both the incidence and the timing of different echocardiographic changes. It's been well reported in the literature about the association of LA dilation associated with atrial fibrillation as well as the development of systolic dysfunction. But we had questions about what, how that impacted uh, ventricular chamber sizes, RA sizes, as well as diastolic dysfunction, which hasn't been well described. So looking over the, our cohort, uh, we found that there was um, clear differences in the incidences of left atrial enlargement, um, which occurred in about a third of patients with atrial fibrillation. And that divergence between the AFib cohort and the non-AFib co cohort occurred pretty early. About six months follow-up, it was evident that those curves were diverging. Um, 
uh, left ventricular systolic dysfunction was relatively uncommon in the cohort. It was only 5% of patients, but those curves also diverged to about a year um, of follow-up. Um, diastolic dysfunction um, was explored in folks who had uh, preserved ejection fraction, and those, cur um, those curves diverged later at about 24 months, which is really curious uh, compared to the systolic dysfunction uh, divergence. And then mitral regurgitation, uh, again, another early um, uh, difference among the AFib versus non-AFib patients with much more MR occurring in the AFib patients uh, evident after about six months. Well, and, and you can take us through figure two yeah. uh, as well here, which I think really nicely graphically summarizes your findings. Yeah. So figure two is um, um, a nice sort of Kappen-Meyer style curve demonstrating the incidence of some of these key echocardiographic findings. Um, on the top row, we have the left atrial and right atrial dilation, uh, more pronounced uh, divergence of those curves amongst the uh, left atrial um, volumes. And uh, next, we are looking at the uh, ventricular chamber sizes, which was not substantially different between both cohorts over our period of follow-up. Um, the third row looks at the incidences of uh, systolic dysfunction, which had a um, earlier separation of curves and a uh, relatively low incidence, as well as diastolic dysfunction, so late, later separation of curves and a higher incidence. And then a marked, um, probably the most dramatic of the separations in the uh, mitral regurgitation um, incidence uh, over the follow-up. And then finally, we look at uh, all-cause mortality, which was uh, not substantially different between the populations during our um, our follow-up period. And John, why do you think there wasn't a difference in all-cause mortality? Yeah, I think it's an important question. So again, if we, if we get think back to who the population is, anyone who had cardiac abnormalities, structural abnormalities at baseline, those patients were included excluded from this cohort. So I think that has something to do with it. I think there's also some good news here. Um, so the vast majority of these patients had their AFib treated. And so if we are, you know, treating patients according to the guidelines, I'm glad we don't see a significant difference in mortality and in intermediate term follow-up. If we followed these patients for 10 or 15 years, maybe we would have uh, seen mortality differences. So I, I think those are, are the two biggest reasons. You know, I, I think one of the points, um, you know, that uh, that Dr. Laring and the team were focused on is that we focused on symptoms for so long in AFib, and that's really appropriate because the symptoms dramatically impair a person's, a person's quality of life, and we should always be mindful of treating symptoms. But we need to move past symptoms, and we need to learn how can we treat AFib so that we avoid any alteration in major cardiac structure and function to the degree that that's possible. And I think that is the next era of AFib treatment, and that's the conversation that we want to put in the limelight. Those are great points. I would add, you know, from a clinician's perspective, the things I've learned when, because when we're counseling AFib patients, we all have very similar educational discussions. And the first one is what their stroke risk is. We know that's five times, and we know Chad's VAST score as well. But we often talk about the risk of heart failure, and I think that's actually unknown. You know, what's the true incidence of pacing induced cardiomyopathy? What's the true incidence of AFib-induced, arrhythmia-induced, tachy-induced, or irregulopathy-induced tachy myopathy? I don't think we know, but I think it probably, with this study, which again is well-controlled, these patients by definition are at Duke, right? They're under clinical care. They're not flying around really rapid either. And, the, and you've excluded the ones with some subtle pre-existing LV dysfunction already. And there might be a lot of people walking around that already have some pre-existing and then they get exacerbated. So I think even 5%, albeit it sounded low to me, it's still very, it's very honest from the data set you're getting and it's a quite robust data set. So I think there's some really great take homes to be able to even refer a patient to this paper and say, listen, this is what will happen if we don't treat this or if we don't pursue sinus rhythm or that you, know, you will get these diastolic changes. The other commentary I would say is when John and I were at medical school together, they didn't teach us about atrial functional MR. They just wasn't an entity that was widely understood. And I do think that the progression of our MR is a really important message, not only for clinicians, but other providers, because many people will come in through the door and get a mitral clip because they have atrial fibrillation and moderate severe MR, but restoration of sinus rhythm might reverse that pathology. So it's really nice that you're able to look at that as well, because the MR might be mixed. It's not all pure LB systolic dysfunction.
Well, anyway, I feel that this is a wonderful, wonderful window um, from the Duke experience and looking at imaging to be able to help us advance our understanding of the natural progression of AFib. Congratulations on a really well done paper. Congratulations on the selection for the January and hopefully our viewers will gain a lot of insights and patience as well. Thanks for joining us, Drs. Loring and Pacini. Thank you.